episodes on inspections, interviews, life-friendly schools, and many more of the episodes that you can find on every podcast platform that you can think of, as well as YouTube. So please go back and have a listen if you haven't done so already. Still continuing with our break time banter and guest speakers and even our get in the bin, go for the win, um, except we're going to try and change it slightly and come up with some tangible takeaways for you, the listeners. So, Jenny, would you like to introduce today's episode? Yeah, so today's episode is all about workload. So how do happy teachers keep a manageable workload? Um, it's something that Roxy and I think we're both quite good at and I think that's quite a key reason why we are um, happy teachers. Um, I've written a chapter for a book where I did quite a lot of research into workload and um, so I think it's something where we can share some really tangible tips to help people. Yeah and I never used to be so good at workload and work-life balance to be fair so I only think that's come in recent years don't you? Yeah, I think it gets better over time, doesn't it? And I think it's one of those things like being a parent has helped us find ways to be more efficient. And yeah, I think it's kind of things we've both learned over what between us, like what, almost 30 years in the classroom. Um, Yeah, yeah, tricks of the trade. So Jenny, you've got our uh, break time banter today. Do you want to tell us your story? Yeah, so again, kind of continuing with season one, I keep trying to make the uh, break time banters like fit into our topic. you can decide, Roxy and everyone else, whether this does link to workload. I sort of think it does. Um, so this one was um, I was teaching a year seven lesson um, and I was getting them to do some paired work before they were going to do kind of a group discussion. And this girl kept putting a hand up and I kept saying, oh, no, 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 no. You're just you're just discussing it as a pair. You don't need to ask me yet. And she thought, no, I just want to check. And I was like, no, no, no. Honestly, just have your discussion. Then we'll discuss it as a group. And then she said, I want to check it's a good question. I'm, I'm sure it's a good question. And she's like, Miss, please. And I was like, okay, fine. So I went over and I was like, what, what is your question? She's like, I don't have a question, Miss, but your trousers have ripped in half. <laughs> Ooh, in half? Yeah, yeah. I mean, quite badly. She didn't kind of specify too much, um, although she did kind of say, you know, things, did knickers are on show. Say again. You know, if it will breeze there. <laughs> No, because it was such a warm classroom anyway. But um, yeah, so the reason I'm trying to link it to workload is that that could be a potentially embarrassing situation. But I think because I'm already a pretty happy teacher, I didn't really kind of feel that embarrassed about it. And I thought, okay, how can I link this into what we're learning and kind of get them to help me think of a solution? So I was like, it's only like lesson one. I've got a lot more lessons to get through with like a broken pair of trousers. So I was doing about William the Conqueror and how he established himself as a good leader. Um, So I said to them, you know, leadership is all about difficult situations. So, you know, right now I'm the leader of this classroom. I'm in a difficult situation. Um, And then I started talking about like my MA where we did like educational leadership. And I was saying, oh, you know, there's a leadership model called distributed leadership. And that means I kind of ask other people for their opinion. So I'm going to ask all of you, what do you think I should do? (laughs) And then I heard some different ideas and someone said, one of the art teachers always wears long cardigans. I was like, brilliant. I did not know that information. So as soon as the lesson was over, went to the art department, got a long cardigan. And the point is, it therefore didn't kind of interfere the rest of my day. I still kind of achieved everything I wanted to achieve and my workload was the same. Jenny, I don't know if I would have told that the same, I'm not going to lie. I think I might have gone out there and then to go and get the long cardigan. (laughs) Oh, no. So Okay, so what I then did for the rest of the lesson, um, I also said, you know, leadership's about, you know, you're in difficult situations, you've just got to get through them. So I was like, my approach is I'm just going to adopt a fancy walk for the rest of the lesson. And I just kind of put my hands behind my back and just did a fancy pants walk for the rest of the lesson, which they quite enjoyed. Fair enough. So you didn't have your butt cheek hanging out. Okay. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I've never had a piece of clothing rip, but one of my colleagues, she... Um, had her top was like had buttons and she didn't realize she'd spent like a good chunk of it with one of the buttons like and she's 
quite a large breasted lady and it was like in the middle was like just completely undone and this was on a parents evening and she was signing the parents in and so I was just like and so it wasn't until this other person noticed and said to her like oh I think you need to go and sort out your top she was oh. like so basically I've been flashing the parents like all night <laughs> Oh, oh, the and I said to her, oh, did they keep coming back to sign themselves? Oh, I'm just checking. Am I, have I signed in the <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, we had a lot of <laughs> I do love a clothing mishap. Um, and I definitely am someone that would be laughing at that. I, see, I would have been the kid laughing in the classroom. I was a nice kid, but I definitely would have laughed at what I teach. I mean, it is, it is funny, isn't it? It's funny. So, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, anyway, today we wanted to talk about workload because as Jenny mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, over time, we've essentially developed some ways. They're not like, you know, fancy pants ways, pun intended. Um, <laughs> they're, not, you know, they're, just, they're just ways that help us. Now, I, I would say, um, you know, this is directly linked to how happy we are at school um, because... It's not about necessarily reducing workload because I do think that is more down to the school to reduce the workload. Like I don't think a teacher themselves individually can necessarily, you know, reduce their workload. Like I, I think it's near on impossible if a school is giving you loads of stuff to do. Like how are you supposed to reduce that workload? But I think it's about finding ways that work for you and can make the workload manageable for you and what you want to do. But I also think, and we'll talk about this, won't we, in a later episode where we're going to reunite our old department. Um, I think we found ways to make it bearable because we work together so well as a team and we found ways of, I don't want to say cutting corners because we still did the job very well, but we worked out how to kind of spread the workload so that we weren't doing maybe the same amount of hours that someone in a less yeah. kind of successful department might have had yeah we yeah I agree with you you have to find th I mean you I think part of workload management actually is prioritizing I do think that is a major thing um and actually it kind of leads nicely into one of my workload tips so I might as well talk about it which mm. is um mm. how I organize my week on week planning um now because I'm quite a seasoned teacher, um, I don't necessarily have to put hours and hours into my planning um, unless it's teaching lessons that I've never taught before. Um, so I feel like I don't have to put so much into it, but I do still plan like what I'm doing for the week. Um, and I like to use post-it notes. Now me and Jenny have spoken about this because Jenny, I know you like to use your teacher planner. Yeah, it blows my your... mind that you somehow don't use a teacher planner. So I don't, I stopped using a teacher planner a couple of years ago because I just found actually, I used to stress myself out filling in the teacher planner because I would be like, you know, I, I need to be, able, I need to do this like however long before and whatever else. So actually what I do is um, I do... Well, I, I've used this right from the beginning, doing lists. Um, and I used to do the list in my teacher plan, but now I just do it on post-it notes. So essentially, I usually have a couple of different lists going on. Um, one is like non-negotiable list that has to be done by the end of the day. So, or by the end of the week, depending on how you want to block your time, essentially. Um, and that is only really a couple of things that I know that I can definitely get done by the end of the day or have some kind of deadline so like you know if it's reports yeah. or something like that that has to be in at a certain time I'm like okay well this this is a non-negotiable like it has to be done by the end of the day and then there's like a kind of a second bout of like post-it notes or lists or however you're going to do it of like I'd like to get this done but it's not essential, like it's a negotiable kind of thing. And this is like, a, OK, you know, this would be good if I got this done. But if I don't get it done, it's not the end of the world. I can do it tomorrow kind of thing. And then there's almost like a final list that is like, a, this is probably not going to get done. <laughs> but <laughs> if I somehow manage to do my non-negotiable list and my other list, then potentially I can do some of these things. So... These might be more like long-term planning things that, 
you know, you don't, again, need to do right then and there. Um, like, for example, I'd really like to do a trip right at the end of the year. Well, actually, do I need to plan that right now? Probably not. Um, you know, so actually, I could probably leave that another couple of weeks and it's really not going to be um, a kind of problem. So I think in whatever way you're doing it, no judgment, Jenny. <laughs> I know no, no, you do teach planner no, and I do patient. It's more in whatever just... way you're doing it, I feel like. Sorry, go on, I interrupted you. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say it's not judgment. It's more the opposite. It's more, I can't quite believe that you can get through life without a teacher planner. <laughs> so, what I was going to say though is that however you're doing it, that kind of organizational side of things is so important when it comes yeah. to workload like and I feel like sometimes I almost have a brain dump onto a post-it note and usually I've got these really big post-it notes that are like basically A5 um, so sometimes I do a bit of a brain dump and I I literally dump everything on there that I have to do and then I go through and prioritize afterwards or you know, as I'm going through the day, I think of things and then I'm like, I'll just quickly write it down and then, you know, however you kind of work. But yeah, I'm a little bit all over the place when it comes to things like that. So I'm not, um, I wouldn't, say, I'm an organised person, but I wouldn't say I'm the most organised when it comes to knowing exactly, you know, what I'm doing, when I'm doing it, um, et cetera. You know, I, just think, I think, as you said before, they're just different systems, aren't they? So, yeah. so I just my link into kind of one of mine. So one of mine is... Um, my spreadsheet I love a good color-coded spreadsheet um, and so what I would do is I'd get the yearly calendar that the you know senior leaders have created that tells me all the reporting deadlines parents evenings um, and then from that I then change that and map on um, schemes of work to do with my department and then from that, I map on exactly when I want to do meaningful marking. So I think about, because mm. what I don't like is when, you know, every school you work at, they normally have a marking policy, don't they? Like you have to mark yeah. every two weeks or you have to mark every seven lessons or whatever it is. And I just really begrudge doing something just because I'm being told to do it if it doesn't make sense to me and my students. So I always mm. try and make sure that I kind of map it all so I know exactly when I'm marking, but that it it's something that's actually worth marking for the students. And that then is all done in a timely fashion so that when I am giving data deadlines, so data drops, it doesn't feel like I'm just giving a random bit of data. It's like, oh, I've marked something really meaningful two weeks before, and so everything I'm doing feels a bit more manageable. So I kind of think it links to what you were saying before about workload, that it's not necessarily reducing my workload, but I feel a lot happier about my workload because all the bits mm. of work that I'm doing feel mm. like they've got a point to them. I don't feel like, oh, it's been two weeks, I need to mark something. And it's just a bit kind of off the, off the hoof. It's more structured and everything kind of makes a bit more sense to me. Yeah, I think it's an important thing to talk about this idea that we're not telling people that you can reduce your own workload I, I feel like that's that's a false narrative I, I feel like you can't you can't say to people oh you can reduce your workload but you could you there are ways of feeling you're right feeling happier with your workload but I think we have to caveat it with saying that if the workload is really too much all the time and mm. there's no let up at all something is terribly wrong like with your school and how they deal with yeah, well -being absolutely. And... it shouldn't be on us to if something yeah it shouldn't be on the individual teacher to just kind of right. keep trying to find methods but knowing ultimately they're still being asked by their senior leaders to do you know way too many hours a week mm, yeah exactly like you know um and it has happened to me in a previous school and i would actually say that's a really big sign of a toxic workplace um and something that you kind of really need to rethink about whether you are, want to be at that school anymore really and whether it's working for you because me and jenny can both report that not all schools are like that yeah. um and there are definitely schools that care about workloads care about well-being and care about kind of where you're at with your job um and you can do your job really really well without being overworked 
It's, yeah, I'm sorry. And I, I, still... I think that kind of links in. I was going to put Cheryl this in the show notes later as well, but quite a lot of the research I was doing when I was doing the chapter, so my chapter was about leaving teaching because at that point I had left teaching. Um, mm. But it was about why do people leave teaching? And I just think it's quite timely because at the moment, I mean, as there often are, there are initiatives, aren't there, about paying teachers more money or yeah. various different things. Um, and actually, that's not what's kind of making people leave. They're not leaving because they're not getting paid enough. Um, mm -hmm. Like every single bit of research that I looked into, workload is one of the key reasons. So like the DfE commissioned research, Work. two thirds yeah. of them that left, they were like, it's because of workload. Um, and I just think it's quite interesting. Like even just the other day, I was talking to another parent and I was with another parent who was a teacher and they were talking about not finishing work until 5.30, so needing someone to pick up their child. And this parent who wasn't a teacher was genuinely shocked. They were like, oh, so you really do stay till 5.30? And she was like, yeah, because I have to do marking and planning. Um, and so again, one of the bits of research that I found was like the average teacher, well, not the average teacher, but teachers can be working up to 50 60 hours a week a lot of the time um and actually our statutory working hours are meant to be 32.5 in a state school um mm. but i do think as you say when you give an average it kind of skews the fact that some schools do it better and people have a much more manageable workload and if you're at one of those schools where you're working 60 hour weeks and you're trying every kind of workload solution you can that's not an okay amount of hours to work as a teacher. No, definitely not. Like, and and you know, it does stop you doing things like picking up your kids from school or going to a workout like club that you like going to or something. I don't know. There's so many different things that you know you want to do kind of in other parts of your life. And workload definitely, definitely contributes to that. Um, so yeah, my other um, workload tip. <laughs> is time blocking so i think it kind of links to my organization side of things so if i've got my non-negotiables for example that i'm going into it like on monday i'm already thinking about monday uh, at this point in time and like on monday i'm thinking okay so my i'm head of year 10 and they've got their mock starting on monday so i need to make sure that i do this this and this and i've got a billion and one things to do in the morning <laughs> that I'm just like going around in my head and I'm thinking okay so actually time blocking the way it works is you you block out your time um and you technically you, not technically you you say you're going to use it for whatever specific thing you're going to use it for so let's say in on Monday I know that I have two hours of freeze like two hours of PPA on Monday period three and four so I'm not going to get anything done in period one two and five on Monday I just know and lunchtime because I'm on duty so I've got two hours how am I going to use it right I'm going to block the first half an hour out um, to look at mock timetables and make sure that all, everything's gone out to parents or whatever else right I'm going to use the second half an hour to do this and then the third the third hour the second hour god my maths is really not mathing tonight um my my second hour i i do have a set of books to mark which are due back on tuesday so my second hour i'm going to block it out and i'm going to mark um for that hour and i'm going to make sure that i get it done in that hour and i think that links nicely to your one of your ones as well about like how like marking and stuff like that but of course we've got so many different roles Mm. of our job um, and so I find that the time blocking really helps me to be like thinking about okay how am I using my time am I using it wisely or am I just sitting there scrolling looking through lessons and like just mindlessly kind of doing things do you know when you say you're blocking it are you mm. does anyone else know that like are you blocking on a outlook calendar that other people can see so they can see what you're busy doing or do you mean you're just kind of deciding how your free periods are going to be used and you're going to stick to that yeah I'm time blocking it's it's, it's solely for myself okay uh, of course if I'm in a meeting or something like that that will be time blocked 
blocked on my calendar um, for yeah. other people to see. Um, but other than actually being in a meeting, no, I don't. You can, you can. I have seen it where um, you can actually, there's lots of things online for free. You can do like uh, time blocking. There's time blocking apps as well where you can actually like input. Some people find that really useful actually. If they've written it down and they've said they're going to do it that way, then they'll do it that way. It's, uh, it must be some kind of mind like thing of the human brain like if you say you're going to do it then you're going to do it for me personally because my time blocking kind of changes every single day you know like some days I have more freeze than others some days I have no freeze some days I have four freeze like there's on a Wednesday I have four freeze and actually if I don't time block I procrastinate I'm really really bad I literally sit there and I, I do things but I definitely procrastinate. So I do think time blocking for me really, really helps me with the workload, um, especially because uh, I, and I'm going to talk about this in the next episode, but I make sure that I've left school by usually by four o'clock every day. I'm, I'm gone from school. So mm-hmm. even time blocking my after school as mm-hmm. well. So like that three till four, because I finish at three. So that three till four, what am I doing with that time? Again, am I aimlessly just sitting there, like, you know, casually marking a book or two or like do whatever? No. Or am I intently using that time to do something specific? I don't yeah. know. It's just to think about. Yeah, like, no, yeah. I think that's what I do. I've just never heard the term time blocking. So I, mm. with my trusted teacher planner that I could not do without, um, if I had a double <laughs> period, I would be almost marking that out with. Yeah almost like in fractions so I'd be like I do like a little line and like this is my marking so one of my things I was going to talk about just very briefly is that I only ever mark if it's key stage three seven books at a time so I would have a little bit blocked out for my seven books um, and then I would do what other tasks that I wanted to do in that time whether that was I don't know marking an A-level essay or doing a bit of planning or something um, but mine would kind of from the lines on my teacher planner, I'd be kind of dividing up my free periods and kind of showing what proportion are going to be used. Yeah, um, you're doing it, you're doing it as well. But yeah, I just, yeah. I feel like consciously doing it, like you're saying, where you're literally saying, right, this half an hour is dedicated to marking. If in that time I finish my marking and I have a little bit of time left, okay, then I can do, you know, something else or whatever. But but this is dedicated to that. Oh, um, see, and uh, of course... It, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, go on, go no, on. I was just going to say, if I manage to actually finish something early, I was just going to ask mm. you what you do, because mm. I, I would see that as like, well done, Jenny, you deserve a break. And then if I still had 10 minutes of my free period left, I would absolutely not be doing work. I'd be like, you were efficient, Jenny, you need a 10 minute break. I mean, yeah, of course, I go and get a cup of tea sometimes <laughs> in my life. In my life. Like, oh, just do a bit more planning. No, no, no. Especially in my, t- where I've got a two hour block, it's much easier to, like I said, to block it off into, yeah, okay, yeah, you'll probably have a bit of time in there when, you know, you're speaking to other people or going to have a cup of tea or whatever else. But um, I think this links quite nicely to your one about, um, well your final one about headphones and yeah I was gonna say because this is sorry this is something that I have only started doing more recently and I think it does depend on the type of workspace Mm. got available so I'm quite lucky that in my current school I could be working in a three different places essentially so once there's a set of computers in the staff room we also have a staff workspace where talking is allowed and then we have a staff workspace that's meant to be a silent workspace so if I really need to get some work done I'm like I've got this one hour and a bit like you said before it's a priority that has to be done today I would work in the silent room because then I know no one's going to interrupt me or um yeah. say I just want I don't know 30 minutes of no interruptions I just put headphones on and and I used to think that was a bit antisocial. And then I thought, God, it's not antisocial at all. Like, if I want to socialise, I'll go into the common room. If I've yeah. got a free period and I want to work, I can put headphones in to help me concentrate. And that do is you quite listen to with me. Or do you just put the headphones in as a... a just exclusively. Basically, like a thing of, like, don't speak to me. Uh, no, I just listen to a lot of Taylor Swift. 
Oh, you do listen to. OK, so I've got a colleague that I am pretty sure she doesn't listen to anything. She ah. just puts them in. But it's almost like a method of saying to people, don't talk to me because I've got headphones in. And actually. It's a polite, it's quite a nice way of doing it, because really, you know, as British people, I feel like we're not going to like interrupt somebody unless mm. it's an emergency, obviously. <laughs> Um, if they've got headphones in. So it's actually a way of doing it without having to be rude and saying, oh, actually, like, I'm doing my work. Like, can you just leave yeah. me alone? It That's saves that slightly awkward conversation, doesn't it? Because I feel like before I did headphones, sometimes people would come to talk to me, you know, work related, but not a priority for that 40 yeah. minutes or whatever. And now I'm just kind of like, oh, you can see that I'm working. So if you are interrupting me, you're consciously making decisions because I've got my headphones yeah. in. Yes, yes, oh. yes, definitely. What's just happened Sorry, that just went. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah, I, I could hear you the whole time. Oh, well, mine just disappeared. It just said we're trying to reconnect you to the meeting there. Just a bit oh. weird. Um, I'm sure we've well, it all, but yeah, basically, we, I think we've said the bit about headphones making it clear that you're trying to work. Yeah, so I think just to kind of reiterate at the end that actually we don't think that you can reduce workload. It's more about managing the workload for you. And if it's really uh, getting too much, then you really need to think about either going to your union or thinking about changing school because it's not like that in every single school um and which links nicely to my get in the bin go for the win so in a that me and jenny worked in we had a rule where no not we had a rule the school had a rule sorry that we had to put lesson plans for every single lesson and they had to be on the system by 8 a.m in the morning and i 100 percent want to put that in the bin <laughs> Because yes. I literally never found it useful at the time. And it was there for a good few years. Like, we'd done it for a very long time. It wasn't something that was just like a test start to see if it worked or whatever else. Um, and it was checked because, you know, if your lesson plan get told, oh, your lesson plan's not there. Oh, Lord, sorry, I made a mistake. Like, whatever else, like, trying to get away with it. It wasn't really easy to get away with but it massively added to our workload for no particular reason um, and so that's why it's my get in the bin because I understand adding to workload if it has a good reason behind it and I can understand why we're doing it fine absolutely fine like I will try and do that work there and that is fine um, so my kind of a tangible takeaway is instead of lesson plans I do think there needs to be some kind of lesson planning, um, which Ofsted actually say, don't they? There doesn't need to be evidence of a lesson plan, but a planned lesson or however yes. they put it. Yes. Um, so I feel like an overview of lessons, uh, that like a lesson objectives or an overarching question um, with however many lessons there are in the scheme of work um, is more than enough. You do not need a full blown lesson plan for every single lesson in order to prove or even show that you have actually planned a lesson. Um, and just because you don't provide a lesson plan doesn't mean the lesson isn't planned. Um, yeah. And I think kind of main thing. And I just think it was just workload for workload's sake, to be honest with you. That and I was. think that's the kind of that's the point, isn't it? If the work is meaningful, I don't even think I sometimes think of some of the work that I do that I love as part of my workload. Like I do really enjoy planning a new lesson. Um, I do really enjoy, um, you know, working on a new scheme of work or something. I think when I think about workload, it's things that are put on me that I don't see much of a point yeah. to. Or admin, like silly admin tasks that basically don't really need to be there. This almost felt like an admin task, didn't it? When we were doing it, it oh, almost felt like, a thing of, you know, oh, well, we're just putting these lesson plans on the system. I mean, towards the end, I don't even think I used to put, put mm. them on or maybe I put them on, but they weren't like great lesson plans because I didn't have time. Even if but I wanted to, I just didn't have the time. Yeah, I think the point is, though, like you were saying before, with your go for the win, what you do instead, if the department have spent the time making a decent scheme of work, 
then yeah. a lesson plan should be completely redundant. And I think departments that maybe don't have great heads of department or haven't spent time, you know, putting a good scheme of work together, then maybe senior leaders feel the need to put lesson plans in place. But actually, mm. if you've got a decent scheme of work, then you should therefore trust everyone that you've employed that they'll use that decent scheme of work to plan good lessons. And also, if you, I always feel like if you've got a PowerPoint, which most of us do for our lessons, that is almost like a, a lesson plan in itself because it's literally structured, you know, step by step, what you're doing in the lesson. Mm-hmm. I'm like, that's a lesson plan in itself. I don't need to then write a separate document detailing what I'm doing in the PowerPoint that I have clearly created with the resources that I have created for this lesson. I don't know, it's just what, something to reflect on. I, I I know why they were doing it at the time, and but it, to me, it's just not something that's needed. So I just think, and this is a theme we've come back to quite a few times, I just think it shows a lack of trust. If you're insisting mm. that your teachers need lesson plans, you obviously don't trust that they plan their lessons well. Um, and then yeah. so you're unnecessarily adding to their workload and maybe you're the sort of, sort of place that people shouldn't be working at because you can get, you know, we've been talking about certain schools, you know, you as an individual teacher can't change your workload massively. You can come up with strategies, but you can change the place you work at. And we can, yeah. we both work at places, don't we, with very manageable workloads. Um, yes, we but have, like, teaching is always going to be difficult, but we've got strategies in place yeah. and it's not, it doesn't start out as an unmanageable workload that we're trying to find solutions for. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah and that ends off our podcast for today on workload Um, and obviously head over to our socials if you want to discuss more we're always there open for the discussion Um, and we would like obviously me and Jenny have myself and Jenny have experienced different workload kind of problems but I know that there's other workload problems that exist that maybe we haven't experienced either so we're always interested to kind of open up the discussion to all the problems that exist um, in teaching, not just uh, the ones that we've experienced ourselves. So, yeah. Um, Thanks for listening. Take care. Great to be back and have a listen to season one if you haven't already. Yeah. And join us next time to speak about boundaries and how teachers, how happy teachers can say no to certain things, which we think are very important. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you.